So whenever you have a question like this, the first thing you do is resolve the vector into its components, which is what you should be doing now. Isn't it? It's uh, Initial speed is 70.0 meter per second, and the angle is given. So you break it up into 70.0 cosine 75 and 70.0 sine 75. Which one is going to be the horizontal component? Cosine is going to be the horizontal, and sine would be the vertical. That's what you first do. But looking at the vertical component, at the highest point, what's the value of the vertical component? Zero. zero. That's why you see a zero there. Look at that. The vertical component at the high. So take a look at that. So in the B part, how much time does it take to go from here till here? Go ahead, find it. How much time does it take to go from there till the maximum height? So to find the time, here is the equation. I know what is going on. So the final is the initial plus AT, but you know why that becomes a negative? Because A is negative 9.8, that's why. And then do the math. You must get 70 sine 75 divided by 9.8, which is 6.90 seconds. Did anybody get that? Okay, what is the C part? What is the horizontal displacement of the shell when it explodes? So you're looking for this distance, aren't we? So since it's the horizontal displacement, now you have to use the horizontal initial velocity. And what do we know about the horizontal initial velocity? Constant. It is constant, and since it's constant, we can only use one equation, and that, what is that equation? Multiply by time. That's it. So displacement is the horizontal velocity multiplied by time, and we already have the time. All right, so x is v naught cosine 75, which is the horizontal component, multiplied by the time. Did you get 125 meter? Yeah. Isn't this the, is, yeah, isn't this the position of launch? So you're asked to find the hypotenuse. Oh, yeah, go ahead, do it. Such an easy thing. You already got this as 125. You got this as 233. And just go ahead and find it. You saw that come up. Something like that. And when you're asked to find the horizontal display, uh, when you're asked to find the displacement, you also have to find the angle. So find tan theta. You know tan theta is opposite side by hypotenuse. Yep, opposite side by hypotenuse, and then you get 233 divided by 125. 61.8 degrees. Does that make sense? Would the angle be smaller than the launch angle? Yeah, think about it, because isn't it curving this way? So when you draw the hypotenuse, isn't that angle going to be smaller than the launch, of course? So. So there is another chapter called circular motion, but this is just a hint towards that chapter. As you can see that that's the Earth, beautiful Earth, and from a height from a tower, an object is 
projected horizontally, because you see the initial velocity is horizontal to you. But as you keep increasing the velocity of launch, do you see that for a particular velocity, it will keep going around the Earth? So if the velocity is really small, if the horizontal velocity is really small, it will fall here. Increase the velocity, it will go further. Keep increasing the velocity, it will keep going further and further until when you give it a certain minimum velocity, it will never come back to the Earth. It will keep going around the Earth. So we have to find what that minimum velocity is. Does anybody have an idea? That is the velocity of all the satellites. You heard of the satellites, of course, going around the Earth. That's the minimum velocity you've got to give to the satellites so that it keeps revolving around the Earth. But here's a question before we get there, or rather a statement. All satellites are continuously falling, true or false? True. But they are falling at the same rate as the curvature of the Earth. You know what I mean by the curve, the curvature of the Earth? And therefore, that distance between that object or the satellite and the Earth is maintained. See, it doesn't get closer. So what is the curvature of the Earth? If you start driving on a seemingly horizontal road, you think it's horizontal. That's what we think. For every 7.9 kilometers that you drive, which is about 5 miles, 7.9 kilometers, you're going down by 4.9 meters. Write down those two numbers that I gave you. Every 7.9 kilometers, so one number is 7.9 kilometers, you are going down by 4.9 meters. Now, 4.9 meters is roughly the height of the ceiling. Not exactly, but roughly. So every five miles, you're going down that much. That's the curvature of the Earth. So now here's my question to you. Listen to this very carefully. If you project an object horizontally, how much will it fall in one second? First of all, does it depend on the velocity you give it? No, because whatever velocity you give it horizontally, what is its initial vertical velocity? Zero. Zero. So find out. If the initial vertical velocity is zero, what's the displacement vertically in one second? Go ahead. V O Y is zero, what is A? Negative 9.8 meter per second squared. Time is one second because I wanted you to find out the displacement in every second. You should have got it by now. Did you get 4.9 meter? Well, negative 4.9 meter. Right? So now I want you to answer the next question. So whatever horizontal velocity you give it, it's going to fall 4.9 meters every second, right? So tell me what should be the velocity of a satellite if it should not come to the Earth and if it should keep going around. Come on, come on. But we've got to take it to a height, right? And then give it a certain horizontal velocity. I'm asking you, what should be the minimum horizontal velocity so it keeps going around the Earth? Come on. 7.9 kilometer per second. Nobody understood? Watch me. If you give it 7.9 kilometer per second, in one second it'll move 7.9 kilometers horizontally, and it'll fall 4.9 meters vertically, correct? Isn't that the same as the curvature of the Earth? That is called the orbital velocity. So write down orbital, O-R-B-I-T-A-L. Orbital velocity, 7.9 kilometers per second. Is that small or big? It's huge. It's five miles, about five miles in a second.
from here to downtown in five seconds. How about that? Less than five. That's huge. Now, what happens if you give it a velocity bigger than that? Like, instead of 7.9, you give it like 8.5. Instead of the orbit being circular, it'll become elliptical. You know what that means? If you keep increasing the velocity, when you hit 11.2 kilometer per second, write that number down, we're gonna prove it later in another chapter, 11.2 kilometers per second. If you give any object that velocity, it'll never come back to the Earth. It's called the escape velocity. Rightly so, escape velocity. And I'm so glad that the escape velocity is big because otherwise people would have been disappearing from the face of the earth and no cops would have ever found them out. Did you understand? But we're gonna get all those numbers. We're gonna prove those numbers in another chapter. We're gonna get 7.9. We're gonna use calculus and get 11.2. That's all there. But this is just the introduction to circular motion and in circular motion, oh, actually, they say it here, they give a very approximate number. I didn't like it. Look, with a speed of, what did they say? 8,000 meters per second. And I said 7,900 meters per second, isn't it? I was giving it in kilometers, so, so that's not the exact one. What I gave is the exact one. Okay. So in circular motion, there's another thing that happens that you need to know. So here you have an object moving in a circular path with a constant velocity. What? Constant velocity. Can the velocity be constant? So I must say the magnitude of the velocity is constant. Or rather I must say the speed is constant. Are you listening? The number is the same. So maybe 20 meter per second here, 20 meter per second everywhere. But isn't the direction changing? Mm -hmm. And velocity is a vector. So if the direction changes, velocity is actually Changing, isn't it? So we're going to take two points, uh, one and two here, and we're going to find out the change in velocity using vectors. Now, in order to do that, look at this triangle by the side. Isn't this the same vector as this one? And you see that this is the same vector as this because they are parallel to each other, are they? And so if you join this, then you know that, keep watching, this plus this is this. Is it making sense? So this, because it's in the same flowing direction, watch. Look at the arrows. Isn't that how you add two vectors? Join them head to head, or head to tail rather? So, so that means this plus this is this, which means isn't this the difference between the two velocities? Like delta V is the difference. Like if 25 plus 3 is 28, then isn't 3 the difference between 28 and 25? So this is the difference in the velocities. Oh, that's a change in the velocity. Wow, look at the direction of the change. Isn't it pointing towards the center of the circle? Look at this vector. So whenever an object moves in a circular path, with a constant speed, it has an acceleration. And this acceleration is always towards the center. Therefore, this acceleration is called the centripetal acceleration. C-E-N-T-R-I-P-E-T-A-L, for those who are writing. Centripetal acceleration. Where does that word come from? Maybe I introduced this before, did I? I think I mentioned in some class. Centripetal, towards the center. Centry means center and petal, P-E-T-A-L, means towards. So the acceleration towards the center of the circle. And we're going to find the value by using similar triangles. Have you heard of similar triangles? Do you see two triangles there? <laughs> Unless you're blind. One there, one here. And here, the, isn't that the radius? That the ra that's the radius at time t, this is the radius at time t plus delta t, and people would look at that and say, what? But the lengths are the same, I know. But if you treat them as vectors, they're not the same, are they? All right, so you have two triangles that are similar, and uh, in similar triangles, you know that the ratio of their sides must be equal. 
And can somebody look at this triangle and tell me which is the side which is similar or corresponding to this one in this bigger triangle? Go. In this bigger triangle. Huh? I can't hear you. Change in R. Very good. So when you take the ratio, this is how I take it. You have a little math coming up there. You want to write it? You can. Or you can just keep staring. <laughs> Sorry, but that's the truth. Okay, so I've divided this by this and this by this. Rearrange that, simple math. Just take delta R to the other side. And then divide both sides by T. I'm dividing both sides by time. Okay, do you see what I did? Divide both sides by t. Somebody tell me what is this quantity? Let's see how fast you can tell me. What is this quantity? Hello? What is delta r by delta t? Huh? Velocity. So in the next step, that becomes velocity. And on the left-hand side, of course, you have acceleration. Isn't this, isn't this the definition of acceleration? delta V by delta T. So that's called the centripetal acceleration, A sub C. C stands for centripetal. So we have proved that centripetal acceleration is V squared by R. That is what I wanted to do. There you go. That again gives you a picture of what happens. The centripetal acceleration vector points toward the center of the circular path of motion and is an acceleration in the radial direction. Sometimes it's called the radial acceleration because it's along the radius. Isn't it along the radius towards the center? So be careful. It's also called the radial acceleration. And another thing is that the velocity vector is always tangential to the circle. Look at this. Isn't this along the tangent? Do you know what a tangent is? Uh, let's check this out. If you have a string with a stone at one end and you revolve it in a circular path, of course, and the string snaps, in what direction will the stone fly? You're rotating it. You can imagine that. You're rotating it and the string breaks. What direction will the stone fly? Come on. Huh? But what's the direction? I know it'll fly at the point the string snaps, I know that, but what's the direction? Is it towards the center of the circle? No. Away. away from the center of the circle? No, it'll fly tangentially. What are you doing? I just told you that the velocity is always, didn't I tell you that the velocity is always tangential? And then I asked you that question. Why did I ask you that? Because students usually make the same mistake that you just made. It'll go away from the center of the circle. No, it'll always fly away tangential. Now you know why, right? Because the velocity at every point is tangential. So it's not always what comes to our mind that's correct. That's the problem with physics. You have to base it on the concepts, okay? Now you know, because I told you, now to add to our troubles, here is another one. Why did they call it AR to make it? Hey, all this time we were talking about, listen, otherwise you're gonna get confused. I was talking about moving it with a constant speed, wasn't it? Like 25 meters per sec. Agree? But what happens if you slowly start increasing the speed? Like start from zero, go one, two, three, four, five. Now on top of the centripetal acceleration, it's also going to have a tangential acceleration. See that? So that was supposed to be labeled A sub T. Please label that as A sub T, not A R. That's all. We overdrew it. So that is A sub T. So now it has a tangential acceleration and it also has a centripetal acceleration. Therefore, what is A? What is that vector A? What does that show? That shows the resultant of the two. 
Got it? Yeah, that shows the sum of the two vectors. So that's why it says the total acceleration is the vector sum of the tangential and centripetal accelerations which are perpendicular, of course. Tangential and centripetal accelerations are always perpendicular. It might be a repeat. If you are seated still, you're not even moving as such. Are you actually moving? That's a terrible question, right? You're like seated there, absolutely still. Are you moving? Wow, what an answer. It depends on the reference frame. Did you talk about that a little bit? Somewhere, or maybe you read from the text. Whatever way, your answer is wonderful. Rest and motion are always relative. Write that one. Rest and motion are relative. You cannot, the, the reason is the earth is spinning. And we are on the surface of the earth, so if you look at us from off the earth, of course we are all moving, aren't we not? Moving like crazy, because the earth is spinning and also moving around the sun, it's real crazy. But we don't feel, why? Because right now our reference frame is the classroom. It's called the frame of reference. And any frame of reference has x, y, z axis. You see the y axis here? You see the x axis and see the z axis there? So every reference frame has the x, y, z axis. And uh, whenever we speak, we are by default speaking about the classroom frame of reference, okay? Or the lab frame of reference. So what happens if you have two different frames of reference? How do you calculate that? Okay, I just took this example from the textbook. It says that there is a train moving at 10 meter per second with respect to the earth, see? Velocity of train with respect to the earth. How is that represented? T, look at this up, T, E, you know why? Train with respect to the earth. Velocity of train. That's how we are always going to show velocities from now on. Velocity. The first letter shows what the velocity is. The second letter shows what it's compared to, or the reference frame. Are you with me? OK, but there is a passenger in the train who is restless and who is moving. So this person is moving with respect to the train. Why is it negative two? Backwards. This person is walking backwards on the train. Okay? And you're asked to find the velocity of the person with respect to the earth. Velocity of person with respect to the earth. Here's a formula, easy to remember. Velocity of the person, P first, with respect to the earth is velocity of the person with respect to the train plus velocity of the train with respect to the earth. Do you see a rule coming up there? Do you see that whatever you end with, you got to start with on the other side? Second one. All right, let's take a look at it again. This is velocity of the person with respect to the train. So you're comparing it with what? The train. Hello? So next, it should start with the train. So it should be velocity of the train with respect to the Earth. And so kind of the T's cancel out, and then you're left with P and E. Did you understand? We're going to work out a problem, then you will see. I will see if you understood. OK. In this example, the velocity of the Earth with respect to the person would be negative 8 meter per second. And if you were asked to find the velocity of the person with respect to the Earth, how would you, what is the velocity of the person with respect to the train? Come on. Huh? What is the velocity of the person with respect to the train? I mean the number. Negative two. Plus, what's the velocity of the train with respect to the Earth? Ten. 
and you would get? I, I wanted you to notice. You got this, but when you flipped it, you got negative 8, which should make sense. You see that? The velocity of the person with respect to the Earth is 8. Earth with respect to the person is negative 8. Okay. So here is a question for you to do. Actually, it's been worked out. I wanted to save time. That's why I took it off the textbook. See? Today, I didn't want to spend time on math. So you have this car moving at 80 kilometers per hour. That's the velocity of the car with respect to the Earth. And there is a truck moving at 70 kilometers per, uh, km per hour. So that's the velocity of the truck with respect to the Earth. And you're asked to find the velocity of the car with respect to the truck. Be with me. You're asked to find the velocity of the car with respect to the truck. Isn't that the formula? Watch. Isn't that how we write? Velocity of the car with respect to the truck is what? Velocity of car with respect to the earth plus whatever we end with. We start with that. Hello? You getting it? But there is a problem. Wait. What is the velocity of the car with respect to the Earth? That's 80 km per hour. Hmm? But what is the velocity of the Earth with respect to the truck? Negative 70. Negative 70. So do you see the vector in the opposite direction, see? Here's the vector for the velocity of the car with respect to the Earth. But do you see that the truck was actually moving this way, but the vector is in the opposite direction. You all understood why? Oh, now it's easy, you just got to find the hypotenuse, which anybody would do, it's not such a... So you get 106 point, point something, I don't know what you get exactly. 106 kilometer per hour, and then you find 10 theta, 41.2 degrees north of east. That's how we do it. Any questions? That brings us to the end of this chapter. This is chapter four done. So now you're able to do after the test, you're able to do the verb assign, get ready for the next exam.